we know we can live life in the spirit, we can live it in the flesh. I think we know how to do it wrong, don't we? Yeah. We got real good at doing it wrong, living life in the flesh. And something, if nothing changes, nothing changes. So that hadn't worked too good for us, then we need to start learning how to live life in the spirit. There's three aspects if we want to be successful. How many of you want to be successful? I don't know about you, but I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired of being sick and tired of, of uh, not meeting up to the expectations that God has had for my life. So there's three aspects of living life in the Spirit that I want to cover. One is to be led by the Spirit. One of the ways Jesus was so accessible is he was led. The word led means to be governed, controlled, or under the influence of a higher authority. Jesus himself, the reason he was 100% successful in his life is he was led by the Spirit, uh, which was his Father in heaven. He was constantly in contact with his Father in, he in heaven. He was under his own Father's authority. I mean, even Jesus operated under authority. He didn't just run on his own. He just didn't say, I'm going to do this today. He was he lived a life that was led by the Spirit. And that's why he was 100% successful. He said, I never do anything on my own initiative. The word initiative means my own accord, or my own volition, or under my own authority. Jesus says, I never ran on my own. I always listened to the Father. I did what the Father told me to do. I listened to the Father and I obeyed Him. I got my orders from a higher level of authority. It was real easy. I just listened and I obeyed. And I don't speak anything on my own initiative. I only speak in what the Father gives me. So when I'm talking to you, even the things that I'm telling you aren't my things. They're the things I'm only talking. I only talk to you about the things that the Father's already talked to me about. So if Jesus led a life that was led by the Spirit, then we're going to have to, to be successful. We too are going to have to learn to operate under God's authority and be led by the Spirit and not run on our own. And the key to being led by the Spirit is to hear God, the rainbow Word of God. We talked about the spoken Word of God. We said the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. One of His jobs is to be the helper, and as a helper, one of His things is that the Spirit lives inside of us, and the Spirit talks to us and tells us the direction we need to be going in. So uh, if we're going to be led by the Spirit, we've got to learn to hear His voice, recognize His voice, and then follow that voice, and that will keep us out of a lot of trouble. The second area is to walk in the Spirit. And the third area is going to be how to stay filled with the Holy Spirit. But tonight we're going to start part two called Walking in the Spirit. Next couple weeks we'll be talking about this. How many of you would like to have a 100% guaranteed method That you'll never relapse again. I'm going to give you tonight a 100% proven, guaranteed method that you can have long term sustained recovery without relapse. How many of you have ever got a few months and then you relapsed? How many of you got a few years and then you relapsed? We all know about that, don't we? And, you know, there's only one real method of 100% guaranteeing, that's to live life in the Spirit. And we're going to talk about that. So, 100% guaranteed method how to uh, have sustained recovery and not walk in the flesh. How many know the flesh is the problem? The word flesh we're going to talk about tonight is refers to the sarks. That's the old, sinful, depraved, corrupt fall in nature. How many know the flesh stinks? The sark stinks. Everybody turn to your neighbor and say, your sark stinks. Well, the problem that keeps us from having long-term sustained recovery, and recovery is our flesh. Okay? I mean, you know, if you want to just make it real, real simple here, it's not my mama's fault, it wasn't that I was rejected or adopted or almost aborted or dropped off at the neighbor's house or whatever. It's, it's, it's the old stinking flesh. Our flesh just downright stinks, doesn't it? It's, it's the old sinful nature. 
It's that part of us that even though we're saved, even though we're filled with the Holy Ghost, it's still that part of us that wants to get high, that wants to satisfy the flesh, that wants to run on its own, that wants to be rebellious and defiant, and doesn't want to be told what to do. We all have that flesh, and it'll be with us till the day we die. The flesh is always looking for a way to express itself, isn't it? You know, I quit smoking finally, and then I started eating like a pig. You know, you give up eating, and then we start drinking again. I mean, it's like it's like an old waterbed that you just patch a leak here, and then all of a sudden it patches a leak, uh, springs a leak over here. You know. And so the flesh, this is what we're doing. It's going to always be looking for a way to express, to express itself. It's going to be a problem till the day we die. We will not be delivered fully from this flesh till the day we get to heaven. And we're going to have to learn how to deal with it. And so this series on walking in the Spirit is going to talk to us about a 100% guaranteed method how to deal with that flesh. <coughs> not eradicate it, but to deal with it. So tonight we're going to talk part one. We're going to talk about a peculiar people. It's the first step to learning how to walk in successful, sustained recovery is to know who we are, our, our identity. How many have ever read Victory Over Darkness? Author is Neil Anderson. In that book, he goes over and constantly talking about our true identity. If, if we're ever going to be successful as Christians. It's 100%. It's not suggested or recommended. It's 100% essential that we learn to realize who we are in Christ. The devil knows who we are. And the devil knows that if we know who we ever, ever find out who we are, he's in big trouble. The devil's a thief. He's a liar. And he wants to keep us in a self-imposed prison so we don't know who we are. But once we find out who we really, really are, then it's going to allow us to learn how to walk in the Spirit. So I want to go, I was going to go another direction, but I felt tonight it's important that, that you understand who you are. And who you are is a very peculiar person. We are a very peculiar people. So let's turn to Galatians 5, 16 and 17. There's something we need to know that we know that we know. Paul knows that he wants us to know it, and he's given us this 100% guaranteed solution or method. In verse 16 of Galatians 5, he's going to talk about the solution. And then in verse 17, he's going to talk about the problem. Next week, we're going to really hammer out the problem and then go back to the solution. So tonight, we're going to Read the solution first, and then we're going to talk real briefly about the problem. Paul says, but I say to you, walk by the Spirit or in the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. Verse 17 says, For the flesh are the sarks that stinking, depraved, rebellious, defiant part of us sets its desires against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh, for these are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please. Verse 17 in the Amplified. Now listen to me. Let me read it to you back in the Amplified. It says, For the desires of the flesh. That's going to be our word. Epithumia. The passion, longing, cravings. It says, The desires of the flesh of the sarks are opposed to the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us. And the desires of the Spirit are opposed to the flesh, that godless human nature for these are antagonistic to each other, continually withstanding and in conflict with each other, so that you are not free and you are prevented from doing what you desire to do. If you look at Romans 7, 
22 through 23. I won't go through it tonight. We'll hit it next time. But actually, it's 14 through 23. Paul talks about this dilemma. He talks about how the things that he doesn't want to do, he finds himself doing, and he, 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 you know, he can't understand why a part of him wants to do good. How many of you know, I think if you're born again, and you wouldn't be here tonight, but most of us, we want to do good, don't we? And sometimes we just don't know how to do good. We, we get in this perplexed thing, why do I drink? I just can't, you know, why do I keep drinking? Why can't I just be like normal people? Why can't I put away the crack pipe? Why do I go back to, to uh, opioids? Why do I go back to putting needle? Why do I go back to sex? Why do I go back to porn? Why, why do we do what we do? And there's like nine different eyes, and I'll hit it next week, but he talks about, I can't understand this. I, you know, I'm, I, I want to do this, but I don't do this. And he goes on in verse 22 and says, I joyfully concur with the law of God or the Spirit that part of me in the inner man, I want to do good. I really do. I, do. I want to please God. I want to do what I can. But I see a different law operating in the members of my physical body, <clears throat> waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is which is in my members. <clears throat> so Paul's. We're not sure where where all this fits in, but we know he processes it and comes up with a, a, a solution that basically wretched man that man, wretched man that I am, who's going to set me free? So he comes to a complete conclusion that man, I, I'm a hopeless case <laughs> except for Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. He says really, bottom line, a part of me wants to do good, another part doesn't. I find this war going on me constantly and I realize I'm going to be in this war for the rest of my life and if I'm going to win this war, there's not much I can really do about it. I can make choices all day. I can curb my behavior. But ultimately, the true self is going to emerge. The flesh is going to do what it wants to do. It's going to make me unable to do the things of God. Who's going to set me free? And he says, you know, and then he turns to the solution, which is Jesus Christ. Amen. Or the Holy Spirit sent back to help us be our helper. And this is about our higher power. So it says that the flesh sets its desires against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. It says these, these are in opposition to one another or they're antagonistic. What this basically says is, is the flesh has been in control all of our life, hasn't it? I mean, since the day we were born, we came up into, I want this, I want this, and, you know, give me that toy and fighting. And you know, we, 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 we came out of the birth canal a mess into a sinful world. We were born into flesh. We didn't do a single thing wrong. We inherited that sinful nature from Adam and Eve that was passed down. We, you know, it wasn't even really our fault. It was given to us, but we still have choices. So it says that flesh is, it, the word, the flesh is in opposition. It literally means to be dug in, to entrench in an attitude of permanent warfare. That means the flesh is dug in and says, I ain't going nowhere. You can shut me down here, and I'm going to spring over here. You can shut me down here, and I'm going to do this. But I'm entrenched, I'm dug in, and I'm not going nowhere. And he's right. The flesh is going to always be there. But at the same time, it says now that we're born again, that the spirit that lives inside of us, that's our helper, that wants to help us live the Christian life, is that he's also, the spirit is also dug in, <coughs> entrenched in an attitude of permanent warfare, and these two that are both entrenched, they're refusing to go nowhere, they're both going head to head constantly. Okay? This is this is just talking about the general nature of mankind. You have the spirit that wants to do good, and it's entrenched and trying to help you. It's not going anywhere either. I mean, you know, the Holy Spirit is you're gonna keep fighting. You may give up, you may throw on the towel, you may quit, but God's not quitting. That's what grace is all about. Grace is basically God hanging on to you when you've let go of him. How many of you ever feel like letting go? I wanted to let go, throw the keys down, and walk off probably three or four times a day. But that spirit won't let me. He keeps saying, oh, come on now. Come on now. I got you, baby. I got you. Just hang on, baby. It'll get better. You know, crying may last for a night, but joy comes in the morning. And for, for whatever reason, for 22 years now, I've had that spirit, praise God, that's dug in. It'll never desert me and leave me or forsake me regardless. And if I'll just 
submit to him and turn to him and cooperate with him, he keeps me going and going and going and going. But at the same time, I got this other part of me. I'm 22 years clean. And I got this other nature, this other side that's dug into and it wants to do its own thing. It doesn't like being told what to do. It's full of pride. It's full of arrogance. You know, it, it, it's always looking to express itself. And today, today, after 22 years of clean sobriety, I can go out and, and put a drink in my mouth and the whole thing would be my sustained recovery could turn into a relapse just like that. And so we got this war going on. And we need to understand that war. Uh, but we need to know how to win this war. And so let's go back to verse 16 now. So we just looked at the problem, and we'll hammer it out next week. But I like to focus on the solution. How many like to focus on the solution? We know the problem. Let's, let's, get, let's, get, let's get on up into the... Give me something, Pastor Dave. Give me some tools. Give me something to help me, okay? I'm going to give you something tonight. It's not me. I'm giving you what Paul. Paul gave it to us. It's right here. I don't have to go to rehab for $100,000 for eight months, do I? Not really. I mean, sometimes we need programming and help. But what I'm saying is, you know, here I got Paul in Galatians 5.16 telling me how to have recovery without relapse. If I'll just do what he says to do, I'll, I'll, I'll have guarantee. I'll never relapse again. I'm here to tell you what I'm telling you tonight. If you listen to what I'm saying, this this is an absolute go-to 100%. This will treat, teach, put it in your library, and uh, we can save a lot of money doing this. So anyway, he says, verse 16 says, but I say walk by or in the Holy Spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. Now listen to what the Amplified says. I love to read the Amplified. Paul says, but I say to you, walk and live in. If you want to throw that word in there, and it's going to be big tonight, I'd, I'd like to add it to that because I think it's proper. It says, if, if, if. I mean, a life's a choice. If I'll go to meetings and I'll do what the Lord, if I'll listen to God and be a doer of the word rather than a hearer only, if I do what God tells me to do, God will tell me what to do. If I obey Him and do it, then, then if I'll do that, then I'll be okay. I love what Peter Lord says. It's real simple. Spend 45 minutes a day, every day with the Lord. Listen to what He tells you and do what He tells you and you'll never have a problem being a successful Christian. Isn't that just so easy? God wants it more than we do, doesn't He? So the Amplified says, but I say to you, walk and, and listen, live habitually in the Holy Spirit. Live in and be responsive to controlled and guided by the Spirit or led by the Spirit and you will not or certainly will not gratify <clears throat> or carry out the cravings of the desires of the sarks or that old human nature without God. Now, I hope y'all can see this now. Are y'all able to read that fairly well? Anybody? Is it kind of difficult? Yeah. Well, we'll try to maybe get a little bit bigger, but anyway, I'll go through them. So if you just listen to me tonight, Paul says, if if we will walk, the word is parapateo. It refers to our behavior, our conduct or the habit, or the pattern, or the manner in which we live our life, our, our lifestyle. It's our, it refers to our choice, how I live my life. How I many you know I can walk anywhere I want? Yeah. Right now. I can walk in the Spirit, I can walk in the flesh. I can walk to the prayer chapel and get on my hands and face and spend time with the Lord. I can walk down here to the ABC by a bottle of Captain Morgan and, and, uh, and end up in the hood at the end of the night and, and in jail after that. That's the way it works. I can walk anywhere I want. It's my choice. So, our walk. People say, well, back when I first got saved, I heard people say, well, how's your walk going? You know, well, I think we're walking pretty good. No, they're talking about my, my, my Christian life. How's, how's that? 
How's that lifestyle that you're living? Is it working for you? How's your walk going? Is it going good or is it bad? Are you walking in a good way? You, you walking in the spirit? You walking in the flesh? So the word means to it means to order. It means to walk about or to order our life or to be or to lead our life with a with a habitual or a practice. And you know the Christian life is a walk. It's it's a, it's not. Uh, Enoch was a man that walked with God. Forget how old he said he was, but it wasn't just Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, and then for two months. It, no, he walked. That means there was a continual habit, a practice that he not lived. And it says that one day God saw that walk was so impressive that it says God says God took him. He was there one minute, and the next minute he was gone. What happened to Enoch? Well, God loved him so much and saw his walk. He was so impressed with his walk that he said, God just says, I want him for myself, and God just took him home. Wouldn't that be cool? But how I many know it didn't start off with just walking today or next week? It, it was a habitual life. I think it was like, somebody tell me, it was like a hundred and some years, wasn't it? Forget how long he walked, but it was a hundred years. He walked with God, not in the flesh. He walked in the spirit. There you go. We can almost close the cave, the books down, and go home. His 100% guarantee is that he walked with God day in and day out. He walked with God. He walked in the sphere of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is the word pneuma, which refers to a realm or a sphere or a position that's been imparted to us in which the Holy Spirit dwells, that if we will dwell, He will dwell in us. It refers to an environment or a specific area. It refers to a place that we habit or live in habitually or a place we frequent. I remember my dog had this Australian sheepdog. He was nuts. And he would run out of the house every morning and run around the pool. And just run around the pool. I mean, he dug a trench like this deep. It was weird. I mean, he just got out and ran circles forever, forever, forever. And the same, he didn't deviate. Same thing. He just dug a trench. And, and he dug that trench so deep that he got into, you know, almost to the point where he had to crawl out of it. You know what I'm saying? But he habitually lived in this circle. He, it, it, it means to encircle a certain environment over and over and over again. It refers to something similar to a blind person. Say a person's you know, singing, he's lived in a house, and uh, now all of a sudden he's struck and blind, and uh, you know, he has to figure way, his way around, and he gets a stick and, you know, and does this, or he has somebody lead him. And, but over time, over years of... of Living blind, he develops a habit and a practice where eventually he can almost throw out his stick and walk around the house and walk right to the microwave, walk right to the coffee pot, walk right to the john and sit down and not even have to feel it. I mean, he's just done it so much he knows where everything. He's even gotten to the point where he can almost walk outside across the street, get the mail, get the newspaper, and maybe walk down to the park because he's lived in this certain environment over and over and over again that he could do it blindfolded. So this life in the Spirit is talking about uh, walking habitually, continually as a habit and a lifestyle in a certain specific environment. And Paul says, if you will walk in the Spirit or in the realm of the Spirit in this environment habitually over and over in this one specific place, over and over and over again, if you'll just keep doing it, walking, 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 and entrench yourself to get such a habit that it'll become such a part of you that you can do it blindfolded. And that you don't even actually have the flesh that even messes with you anymore. I mean, when we discipline ourselves for godliness, and we make a practice and a habit of discipline, the disciplines of the Holy Spirit, of discipline, and we do it over and over again, it becomes so habitual uh, that we don't even have as much of a problem with the flesh. However, at, at any moment, we can make a choice and open up the flesh again, can't we? I cannot feed that old dog. He can go over there and turn into a 110-pound pit bull, and he can turn into a 35-pound pit bull and not even have one bit of, a bit of fight left in him whatsoever, but he ain't going to ever die. And the minute I throw him a pork chop, the game's back on, isn't it? Boy, he'll come to life, won't he? My dog will sit there and just look like this forever, man. And 
you know, he hears me just walk up to the refrigerator. He's up, you know. Game's back on. So Paul says if you will habitually walk or order your conduct and your behavior over constantly into the realm of the Spirit, then you will absolutely, the word will not is the word absolute. It refers to an absolute certainty. Guaranteed, positive proof, he says. Paul says if he will habitually walk in the realm of the Holy Spirit, you absolutely will not fulfill which means teleo, to carry out or to complete or bring to completion the desires that are magnets and the magnet that I want to smoke, I want to use, I want to get, have sex. I, you know, those desires is the word epithumia. It means the lusts, the longings, the passionate cravings, the impulses, the obsessions of the flesh, our old sinful nature. My man Rick Reiner, if you ever want to get into some good Greek studies, look, listen to, uh, look up Rick Reiner's Gems of the Greek. And he says, make the path that you habitually live in. I want to add some words to it here. Make the path of the Spirit the place. You can walk anywhere you want, but make the Spirit the place or the environment where you habitually live and walk become so comfortable in this new spiritual path that you learn to leisurely and peacefully stroll along. How many of you like to leisurely and peacefully just stroll along in life? Without getting high. In that realm, living your life in the spirit realm, this is the best way to guarantee that you will not allow the yearnings of the flesh to creep up to fill you and cause you to relapse. So if, 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 if we will learn what it means to walk in the Spirit habitually and order our environment into that realm and level of the Spirit, then we absolutely will not carry out the desires of the flesh, okay? Now let me begin to take you to talk about what that really means. Life in the Spirit. Okay, let's go there. Turn with me to Titus 2.14. You know we need to do some walking and less talking. Don't tell me what you own. Let me see you walk. Just walk this thing out. I'm going to talk to you now about. We're going to talk about a peculiar people. Our identity, who we are in Christ. The first step to learn how to consistently and eventually walk in the realm of the Spirit. And that's first we have to know who we are. And with God's help tonight, I'm going to try to impart to you a really cool Greek gem that comes out of Kenneth Weiss' study, so I stole it from him. But the word, it says, it goes through, and then verse 13, it says, Who gave himself, meaning Jesus, to redeem us, or to purchase us back, to buy us back from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession. Zealous for good works. The Amplified says a people that are peculiarly his own or the, new, the King James says that for a, he wants to purify a people or a peculiar people. Now that's kind of a peculiar word for him to refer to us as peculiar, isn't it? First thing we do when we think of somebody that's peculiar, we say, that guy's a little weird. That guy's a little peculiar there. Barney used to tell Annie, something ain't right about that guy. Barney or Annie, something shifty about him. Might use the word queer, you know, I mean, just strange or awkward or something very unique in, in a sort of weird sort of way. But that's not what we're referring to here. Now, the word peculiar is made up of two Greek words. It means to be around 
and to be something. It's charted by a dot within a circle. As the circle is around the dot, so God is around each one of His saints. The circle monopolizes the dot and has the dot all to itself, so God has His own all to Himself. They are His own private, unique possession, and He has reserved them all for Himself. What this says is that God chooses, doesn't He? Is that chooses or is it two O's? Two O's. Okay, I just put that there to see if you catch it. So this refers to God offers the realm of the Spirit. The pneuma. It's a sphere. It's a realm. It's an environment. It's not uh, it's not really real, but it is real. Does that make sense? Uh, it is a place, but it's a place in the supernatural realm. It's, 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 it is here, but you know, it, it, it's not something uh, that we can see. Jesus said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and His right will be added. Part of what this really is, is the kingdom of God there in that scripture does not refer to a place in heaven where they're sitting around the clouds playing the harp and singing hallelujah, throwing the crown. No, the kingdom of God was, Jesus says the kingdom of God is now available. Jesus came, he said, he brought the kingdom of heaven, the sphere, the realm that God lived in, that Jesus was enjoying, or he lived in the spirit in heaven. It was the kingdom. And Jesus said, when he showed up, he said, the kingdom of heaven is now available. It's available to you. He says, that, that same environment that I enjoyed in heaven, I brought it down here. And people were saying, uh, Okay, where is this kingdom? Where, where is it at? It's, you know, he says, no, 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 it's not something you see. It's something you enter into by being born again. It's something that I'm offering to you to enter into my realm of the Spirit and to enjoy it. It's, it's, not, it's, it's, it's not a physical. It's where I rule. The kingdom of God it refers to kingship. The word is actual kingship. It refers to God's rule and reign over us. It's our choices that we make we can, we can enter into the kingdom and become born again, but then we can step out of the kingdom. Okay, we can let God rule in His life, but all of a sudden I decide I want to have a stinking rotten attitude. I want to get angry. I want to throw a pity party. And at that moment, even though positionally you're in the kingdom, experientially you step out of the kingdom into the kingdom of darkness. You're in the kingdom still, but your experience is now changed because of your choices. The prodigal son was in the family. He chose to go out of the family. He was always a part of the family. But he chose to walk out of the family. Even though he was in the family, he wasn't in the family. He was in the family, but he wasn't in the family. Are you with me? Positionally, he was, but experientially, he made choices that took him into the pig pen where he impoverished his whole life and wasted it on depraved living. Life in the flesh. Had it in the spirit, living at home, but he chose a life in the flesh. And where does the flesh end up? You sow to the flesh and you reap destructions. That's where he ended up. So, let me tell you what this literally means. The Spirit is a, is a place, it's a, it's a environment, it's a specific area, it's a specific place, And we once were outside, weren't we? Let's, let's, let's look at uh, 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. First Peter 2, 9 and 10. It says, but you, who, who's, who's Peter referring to you? Meaning, meaning you saints, Christians. Saints, let me tell you what a saint is. A saint is not a sinner saved by grace. A saint is, is now a saint that sometimes sins, occasionally. To have her practice in life now is that we don't sin all the time anymore. We, we, our habit now should be that we sometimes sin, and if we do, we've got forgiveness because we have an advocate with the Father. But a saint now is a holy one. That's what it means to be holy. It means to be set apart. It means to be different. 
The minute we were born again, God's righteousness was imputed to us and we immediately became holy ones. I'm here to tell you today, I'm a holy one. Sometimes my behavior is unholy and I act like it when I let the, dig, the flesh dictate to me. But either way, positionally, I've been an imputed righteousness where I've been declared in right standing and now I'm a holy one. My habit and my practice now should be that sometimes I sin. It shouldn't be a sinner saved by grace. I'm a holy one. And if you're born again, you're a holy one. So he says, I've you're a chosen race. I have handpicked you. You're a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You're set apart as a whole nation. You're a people or a peculiar people of God's own possession so that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who caused you out of darkness into His marvelous light. Now listen to verse 10. For you once were not God's people, but now you are God's people. You have not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So the word... Peculiar now, what it really means is that you're special. The word is preciousness. It means to be highly favored or an exalted one. And it means to be protected. So I once was out here in the world, I was running in the flesh. Out here in the world, God did something to me. You once were dead in your trespasses and sins, blah, 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 but it said, but God, glory to be, I was in my crack addiction, I was out, and God came and got me, God rescued me, but God, because He was rich in kindness, rich in mercy, He delivered me, and by grace I've been saved. I'm here today standing because of God choosing me. I didn't choose Him, God chose me. There's no way I could quit drinking. Never. There's no way I could quit sex. There's no way I could quit getting out. There's no way I could quit being that. God did something to me and in me. God worked through me. That's what sustained me. That's what has happened to me. Now, if I will walk by the Spirit, I will not carry out the desires of the flesh. Amen. So I've been transferred into this new sphere. It's not a place, but it is a place. It's called the sphere of the spirit realm. And now he says, if I will walk in this new realm, habitually order my environment over into the sphere of the Holy Spirit, then I absolutely will not carry the desires of the flesh. So positionally, I've been placed in the sphere of the Holy Spirit. It's been done. I'm a holy person. He's put me in here. He's transferred me from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. He's transformed and transferred me and He's an imputed to me and now I can walk in the Spirit. Amen. If I will stay in the Spirit realm and walk in the Spirit realm and I'll get in the habit of walking and walking and walking and walking and circling and trenching and stay in the Spirit realm, then how in the world can I ever operate in the flesh? If I'm in the Spirit, how can I drink? You can't drink Jim Beam and be in the spirit at the same time. You can't smoke crack and watch pornography and that's not walking in the spirit. But how many know experience that we've been given free will and a choice? So I can walk anywhere I want. God's given me a new opportunity now to walk in the spirit and to have a life living in the spirit or I can choose to walk in the flesh. So Paul says in Galatians 5 16 he says but I say to you this is a this is not a command here this is really weird I have to I gotta think about this he's not commanding he's not saying I'm telling I'm not telling you what to do but as a pastor I've got a little something I got a solution I got a method I got an antidote and I'm telling you it's guaranteed but you have to choose it and you have to put it into place it's not a command but it says it's a highly recommended suggestion now, I ain't telling you what to do, but but if you really want to walk in the Spirit and you want to have victory, then I'm telling you the answer. It's real simple. You've got to walk and live habitually in the Holy Spirit. So he says, if you will walk, parapetail, conduct your behavior, practice and order it constantly by or in or live in the Spirit, the, the pneuma, the sphere, the realm of the Holy Spirit, and you dwell in that specific area, then you will not, the word refers to an absolute certainty. 
Not maybe, but it's absolute. This is what I love with He said this is an absolute. He uses a powerful, powerful word there. He said, I want you to know something. Not just, this is an absolute certainty that you will not carry out telio, fulfill, carry out, and allow the flesh to run its purposes. You will not carry out the desires, the epithumia, the lusts, the longings, the passions, the cravings, the obsessions of the flesh and the sarks. Now, Kenneth Weiss says, and in closing, listen to this. He says, but I say, through the instrumentality, through the avenue or through the method of the Holy Spirit or by the Holy Spirit. This, you know, here, this is important right here. Walking on the Spirit, walking in the Spirit requires that you walk in the, in the Spirit. It means that you have to do it under the influence of being led by the Holy Spirit. It has to be through the instrument. Not through your human willpower, but the instrument, the avenue, the path that you have to do it in is through and by the Holy Spirit. In other words, you have to do it with the Holy Spirit. You step out, you do your part, you walk in the Holy Spirit. In other words, you live in the Spirit, but then God sends you the Holy Spirit to help you. You're not alone in this. So as you walk in the Spirit, you've got the Holy Spirit empowering you, energizing, motivating you, driving you to want, to want, to want, to want to do good. So I say, in order to the instrumentality of the Holy Spirit, habitually order your manner of life, and you will in no wise execute the passionate desires of the flesh. Paul, Paul realized that there's going to be time where you're going to get out of here, aren't you? Your flesh is going to want to run, and if you start seeing it run out the door, you've got to go, oh, no, 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 no. No, 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 we're not going to go get angry. We're not going to hold resentment. No, we're not going to go smoke dope. We're not going to go grab cigarettes. We're not going to go grab a bucket of ice cream. No, 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 no. no. We're, we're not going there. I'm the boss. Through the Holy Spirit, I control what goes on. I walk where I want to walk. You're not going to walk out there. So you say, oh, no, I order you. Get your butt back. It's our job. Listen, we have to order it. The Holy Spirit can move us, but I've had to go and say, no, 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 no. You get your butt back home. And, I mean, how many had a mama like that? No, 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 no. This is how our family walks. This is how we live. That's not what we do. Get your butt back home. Get up off your temper tantrum. Get out of that self-pity. Get up and do what you want. Paul says if you will continually live in and habitually, constantly conduct and order your behavior back over into the sphere of the Holy Spirit, you absolutely will not Carry out the desires of the flesh. But let me ask you tonight, how you been walking? You been walking in the spirit or you been walking in the flesh? This is the battle. Paul said, Do not be deceived, God is not mocked for whatsoever man sows, this he will reap. For the one who sows to the flesh will reap from the flesh corruption. But the one who sows to the spirit will from the spirit reap eternal life. I don't know about you, but I want life. That's our word Zoe. The abundant life. Amen. Amen. All right, next week, part two. Let's come back and uh, I'm going to hit it. I'm going to really hit hard, all right? See you.